I invite the congregation to stand as you're able and turn to face the entrance to the sanctuary where a baptismal font is located as we begin our time together with the brief order for confession and forgiveness as you see that on the screen or as it appears in your bulletin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake, forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing our gathering song together, hymn number 504, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Set up. 
with you. The prayer of the day for this Reformation Sunday is found printed in your bulletin. You'll also see it on the screen. We pray together. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Fill it with all truth and peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is an error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in need, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. If there's any kids here this morning who would like to come up uh, in front for kids' time with me for just a moment, Come on up right now, okay? I'll make it worth your while, I promise. Come on up. There's no right age for this, by the way, any age. Come on up. Ugh. How you guys doing? Go ahead and have a seat. Oh, you're looking good. Hey, you guys excited about tonight? What's tonight? Halloween. Halloween, yay! Halloween was always one of my favorite holidays when I was little. And you know what I really liked about it, aside from the candy? I like being able to dress up and be someone else, you know? Just to put on a face, especially if no one could recognize me. Um, what are you guys going to be for Halloween? A magician. Nice. Huh? A witch, a magician, what else? I remember being a cowboy once, which doesn't sound very exotic here in Spearfish, but in Minneapolis, that's pretty, that was pretty exotic, you know? <laughs> I was a cowboy, and I was a football player once, and I was a pirate once. Anybody else want to share what you're going to be for Halloween? A giraffe, nice, nice. A scientist, good, all right. I've got some pictures up on screen. You know what I really like about dressing up is that you can pretend to be somebody else, but it's really you inside. These are some pictures of my kids when they were little. And one year, they, got to, they decided to be really scary. And my daughter, Becca, who's the oldest one there on the left, you know what she is? She's a piece of corn candy. Can you imagine <laughs> getting a whole bucket full of corn candy for Halloween? Ooh, that's frightening, right? And Leith was a lion. That's pretty scary, don't you think? But Karen, she's the one kneeling in front. She's the scariest of all. You know what she is? She's a dentist. <laughs> That's right. See her little nitrile glove? You can't hardly see it, but yeah. She wanted to be a dentist and be something really scary for Halloween. And one of the next years, why don't you flip the screen? Oh, there they are. They're cheerleaders one year. Now, that's not too scary, right? Until you get into high school. Then go ahead and... <laughs> Flip the screen, and there's Car, and she's a clown. Clowns can be pretty scary. Yeah, <laughs> right. 
and Lisa Cowboy. And is there another one or is that it? Oh, yeah, that's, this one was really fun. Karen was a nurse, and she was taking care of her elderly patient, who is Leith, dressed up as a grandma, and she went around with him with a little IV bag. And you know what was really fun about this one? Is they went to a house in our neighborhood, and we didn't know who they were, these people. You go to houses, and you don't know who lives in them, right? And they knocked on the door and said, trick or treat. And the lady who answered the door said, oh, you have to come inside. And they came inside, and this lady said, Grandma, it's you at the front door. <laughs> and, and Grandma was sitting on the couch, and she looked exactly like Leith with the, <laughs> with the glasses and the blue hair. It was really funny. But that's one of the cool things about trick-or-treating is that you get to go to houses, and you don't know who lives inside of all those houses, do you? But if a light's on and maybe they've got some jack o lanterns out front or some decorations, you know that's a house you can stop at, right? And they'll just let you in. You know why? Because one night of the year, we really are neighbors with each other. That's what I really love about Halloween. And even though you're dressed up as giraffes or scientists or witches or whatever you might be dressed up as, underneath you're just a kid and you belong to the whole neighborhood. And when you go trick-or-treating, nobody asks you, what school do you go to? Nobody asks you, do they? What neighborhood you come from, where you live? They don't ask you that. They don't ask you what church you go to, do they? No. They don't ask, who did your parents vote for in the last election? Nope, they don't ask that either. All they do, all you do is say trick-or-treat, and they give you treats. It's amazing. When our little boy was, um, well, he's not so little anymore, but when he was three, he got trick-or-treating, and it's the one time he really remembers for the first time, you know? And when he got back and he was looking at all his candy that he had gotten, you know what he asked us? He said, can we do this again tomorrow night? <laughs> and we had to explain to him, he only, we only get to do it once a year. But he's kind of right. Wouldn't it be neat if you could trick-or-treat all the time? Wouldn't it be neat if we could go to neighbors' houses and they knew that we were just kids who belonged to them too? Hmm? and we were all neighbors together, wouldn't that be nice? I think one night a year, the world is how it's supposed to be when we treat each other as neighbors, and we open up our doors, and we welcome kids. Hmm. Halloween, do you know what the name means? Halloween? It comes from All Hallows' Eve. Hallows means saints, and it's the night before All Saints' Day, which is always November 1st, All Saints' Day. We celebrate it on the first Sunday of November every year, but all saints means we remember all those who have gone before us in the faith, those of our loved ones who have died and are now with Jesus in heaven, right? And All Hallows' Eve was a night where Christians used to believe that the distance between us and the saints who have gone before us was the shortest. It was the thinnest. And we could almost feel those who have gone before us right there with us. And it's not because of any magic or any weirdness on Halloween. It's because when we remember somebody who has gone before us, when we remember somebody who's died, when we remember, it's like they're right here with us, right? It's like they're really close. So this Halloween, I want you to remember something. I want you to remember those that we love who aren't here any longer with us. Maybe it's grandmas or grandpas or great-grandmas and great-grandpas, or maybe it's a friend or someone very close to us that we remember who's with Jesus now. But we remember that they're really close, and the best way to honor them is to be close to one another, too, to our neighbors. So that's what we're going to celebrate this Halloween, right? Now, let's have a prayer, but don't go anywhere yet, okay? Let's fold our hands, bow our heads, and let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for fun times when we can dress up and we can pretend to be somebody else for just a little bit. And we thank you especially that we still remain who we are. We remain your children. And we also remain the children of all of our neighbors. We all belong to each other. We thank you for community and for church and for the love that comes into our lives, even through strangers. That's what we really celebrate on Halloween. And so we ask that on this day that um, you remind us that we belong first and foremost to you and that you love us and you care for us. All this we pray in Jesus' name, knowing that you hear us. And all God's children said, amen. amen. Now, I get to be the first place you go to for trick-or-treating today. 
Okay? So why don't you take one of these on your way back to your seat and don't lick it and then put it on the pew, okay? <laughs> or don't stick it in your neighbor's hair. Just go ahead and take one. There you go. There you go. You got your haze, you want one? There you go. You can pick one out too. Lesson is from the book of Ruth, the first chapter, and it can be found on page 210 of your Pew Bible. Ruth, a Moabite woman, goes above and beyond the call of duty to accompany Naomi, her Israelite mother-in-law, to a new life back in Israel. In loving and tender words, Ruth pledges to stay with Naomi and to adopt Naomi's land and God, her God as her own. The reading. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elamech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of the two sons were Mahlon and Shilion. They were Ephrazites from Bethlehem in Judea. They went into the county, country of Moab and remained there. But Imelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These two Moabite wives, the name of one of whom was Ophrah, and the name of the other Ruth. When they had lived there about 10 years, both Mahalon and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, and she and her two daughters-in-law, they went on their way back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, and as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find security, each of you in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb, that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, and even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters. It has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Oprah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, No, do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. And your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. The word of the Lord.
The second lesson is from the letter of Paul to the Romans, the third chapter, and it can be found on page 915 of your pew Bible. Paul's words stand at the heart of the preaching of Martin Luther and the other Reformation leaders. No human beings make themselves right with God through works of the law. We are brought into a right relationship with God through the divine activity centered in Christ's death. This act is a gift of grace that liberates us from sin and empowers our faith in Jesus Christ. The reading. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law. For though the law comes, the, through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed, and it is attested to the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift, through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. 
It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By what of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. The word of the Lord. I invite you to stand as you're able for the gospel acclamation. Gospel according to St. John, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus said to the Jewish leaders who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And they answered him, We're descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying, You'll be made free? And Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Well, my dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. In other words, we understand that a person is put in a right relationship with God by trusting God who is trustworthy, not by anything that we do. And that proposition so beautifully summed up by the Apostle Paul in just one sentence in his letter to some Christians at Rome, that is our North Star, right? That is our guiding principle, our touchstone for understanding how we stand before the one who made us. And that proposition was the flashpoint for the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century that uh, sent a monk named Martin Luther on a path toward calling the whole church, the whole church, back to its foundation a love that's made visible in Jesus that is so unexpected, that is so unearned, so undeserved, that it strains the bounds of credibility. To a people so used to hearing that they get what they deserve, you know, that you get what you pay for, it's a pretty radical notion. But of course, it's what makes the gospel gospel, right? Good news. The crazy, wild love of God for people is absolute pure gift. Understanding ourselves to be recipients of such a gift, perhaps then we might be driven to love other people the same way, not waiting until it's deserved or earned, but simply giving it away. Now, we tend to read the same scriptures every year on the Sunday of the last Sunday of October every year on Reformation Sunday, text assigned for today, Paul's words from Romans, of course, and Jesus' words from the Gospel of John, the eighth chapter, telling us that we will know the truth about God's honor and love, and knowing it will make us free. But this year, I was pleasantly surprised to discover that the alternate reading for the Old Testament For the 23rd Sunday after Pentecost is the story from the book of Ruth, a book that we almost never read from in worship. So I thought I would tell you the story of Ruth this morning, and we will see where it takes us on this Reformation Sunday. Now, the first thing you need to know about the story of Ruth is that it really is kind of a hinge story in the Old Testament, connecting... um, The covenant stories that came before of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob, Rachel, Leah, Joseph, 
to Moses and the Exodus, to the conquest of a promised land for God's people. It connects those stories with everything that came after that, the period of the kings and the prophets. We've got all these stories about how God is busy keeping promises to a bunch of very crusty, very human people, okay, even when they weren't always very faithful. But God remains faithful. You got that, and then you've got this period of the kings and the prophets in which um, the covenant promises that had been made in the first part of Genesis, they're almost totally obscured by the people's faithlessness, by war and exile, almost to the point where those promises of God are all but forgotten. And in between those two parts of Israel's history lays the story of Ruth, a story of crazy, loving, wild commitment between two grieving, all but hopeless women, Ruth and Naomi. So, here we go tell you the story very briefly, as briefly as I possibly can. In Bethlehem of Judea, now that should immediately have some bells going off in your head, right? You know Bethlehem, and you know what happens in Bethlehem. Well, in Bethlehem of Judea, there was a man named Elimelech who had married a woman named Naomi. Bethlehem, the house of bread, that's what it means, the house of bread. Ironic, since there was no bread there, not now. There was a famine, there was a drought going on in that place, and nobody was having enough to eat anywhere. So Elimelech decides that he will take his wife, Naomi, and their two sons, and they will head out to the land of Moab, which is over in the east, all the way on the other side of the Dead Sea, which means they had to travel up north along the banks of the Dead Sea, cross the Jordan River, and come back down into the land of Moab, where they've heard that there's actually food. And so they do that very thing. And when they get to Moab, after living there for a little while, their two sons, Machlon and Kilion, they marry two Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. So they've got their little family. Well, in short order, Elimelech gets sick, and he dies in the land of Moab, away from his ancestral homeland. That leaves Naomi a widow. But she's still got her two sons and her two daughters-in-law. They live in relative ease for about 10 years. And then all of a sudden, unexplicably, Machlon and Kilion, Naomi's sons, they die, leaving her with now her two daughters-in-law. And now the famine that had once been over in Bethlehem, in that area, in the area of Israel, has now extended all the way over into Moab. Drought, no food. It's almost like Naomi has to feel cursed, forgotten by God. But she has heard rumors that, hey, there's been some rain falling back in Bethlehem, back in, back in Israel and Judah. So maybe she ought to go back home. So that's what she decides to do. She's going to go back and see if she can't find something there because prospects for her in Moab are next to nothing. She has no, no men anymore in her life, no husband, no sons. And that left her destitute. And she wanted to give her daughters-in-law a future. They want to go with her. They say, we'll go with you, Mom. We'll head over to Bethlehem with you. There's not much here for us either. Our husbands are dead. And so they start out with her. They travel maybe a couple of days. And finally, Ruth says, or Naomi says, Ruth, Orpah, you guys can't stay with me. Go back home to the homes of your mothers. Try to find new husbands. Maybe it'll be that you have a future. Maybe you can have a life, but it's not with me. Let me go my way. I'll go back home by myself. Well, they both protest, of course, because Naomi is getting up in years and it would be an arduous journey. She probably wouldn't make it by herself. But Naomi persists. Go back to the homes of your mothers. I don't have, what am I going to have, sons for, for you to marry? Even if I were to meet someone tonight and we were to have a child and you'd have to wait and that'd be, what, 20 years, 25 years down the road, are you going to wait for that to happen? No, go back home. Orpah kisses her and goes back home. But Ruth clings to her all the more tightly and says, Mom, I'm not letting you go. I'll go back there with you. You're my only family now. 
Your place will be my place. Your land will be my land. Where you die, I will die. Your God will be my God. I am not letting you go. Any of you all had that read at your weddings? Anybody pick that at a wedding? I've had, every once in a while, I've had somebody ask if, you know, maybe I, I say, yeah, that's fine, you can do that, but remember, the bride has to say it to her mother-in-law, not to the groom, because that's who it's to, right? That's who the promise is. No takers so far that I've, that I've had on that. But she goes back there with Naomi to Bethlehem, the house of bread, to see if maybe there's a future for the two of them. Well, they arrive in Bethlehem, and the whole town's buzzing. Hey, did you hear Naomi's back? It's been decades since she's been gone. Really? Yeah, and she's brought her daughter-in-law. One of her daughters-in-law, Ruth, is along with her. Well, Naomi and Ruth still don't have many prospects, even though they're back home, because they have no men in their life. They have nothing in that culture. And it is about the time of the harvest, though, so there is actually food starting to come. And Naomi sends Ruth out. She says, daughter, why don't you go out into the fields and glean and see if you can't get us some grain? It was a common practice in that culture when there was a harvest that there would be the reapers going into the field cutting down the stalks of grain, right? Maybe it was wheat or barley or whatever, and then they would collect that. But there's always some that fell to the ground, some of the heads of grain. They wouldn't get everything. And there would be poor folks that would come behind them, and they were allowed to glean. That was part of the social safety net in that culture, right? So Ruth goes out, sent by Naomi, to glean in the fields. And she finds a field in which to do that and follows the reapers. And it just so happens they got into part of this field that belonged to a man named Boaz. Now Boaz, it turns out, was a relative of Elimelech's, Naomi's dead husband. And Ruth goes ahead and gleans behind the reapers all day long. And pretty soon Boaz shows up to his field. And he asks the reapers, how's it going? How's the harvest? Pretty good. It's going well. He says, who's that young gal following the reapers over there? I don't recognize her. And they say, oh, that's Naomi's uh, daughter-in-law, Ruth. You know, remember the story? She lost her husband. Well, Ruth has come back with her pledge to Naomi. And, you know, she's been on her feet all day. She hasn't taken a break once. And this impresses Boaz, you know. His own workers take breaks, you know, but she was out there all day long picking for whatever grain she could. And he said, hmm, why don't you send her over, call her over here. Now, it didn't hurt that Ruth was a fairly, you know, good-looking young gal, right? And so uh, Boaz is kind of interested, and so he has her come over. He says, daughter, who, who do you belong to? And she says, well, my, my, I came with my, my mother-in-law, Naomi, he goes, oh, yes, I've heard that you've been taking good care of her. Um, blessings be on you for that, uh, to, to have such commitment. You've been gleaning all day, I see. Why don't you just stay in this field? Come back tomorrow and glean behind my reapers. And that way, you know, don't go into some other field where the guys might bother you. You know, they might harass you. You just stay here. You'll be good here. And in fact, if you get thirsty, don't worry about that. Just go to the jugs over there that are for my reapers. You can drink whatever you want. They'll take care of you, and they'll make sure nobody else bothers you. You just stay behind them. And so she does that very thing. And in fact, that evening, he sits down and has supper with his workers, and he invites Ruth to have supper with them. And she gives, he gives her an extra measure of grain at supper time, and she has leftovers to take back to Naomi. And she goes back to Naomi after the day is done. And she comes back with a whole sack full of grain that she has gleaned and the extras, the leftovers from supper. And Naomi's like, well, whose field did you glean in today that you brought all this back to us? He said, there's a man named Boaz who I met who really looked after me. Do you know him? And Naomi's like, did you say Boaz? He's a, he's a relative of ours. He's a relative of your dead father-in-law, Elimelech. In fact, hmm, she starts thinking about this. Girl, I think I might have a plan for a future for you. Tomorrow, you go back to that field. You don't go anywhere else. You, do, you go back to that field and you glean all day. You just stick close to Boaz while I work things out. So she does that very thing. She goes back and gleans the next day. And the next night, Naomi's got a plan. She said, he's our relative, this Boaz. That means that he has right of first refusal in taking over 
the responsibilities of a husband for your dead husband, my son. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to the threshing floor tonight. There's going to be a big threshing party down there at Boaz's place. Don't let anybody see you and don't let him recognize you. But when you get there, when after the party's kind of winding down and he's had enough to eat and drink and he goes to lay down and go to sleep, here's what I want you to do. I want you to sneak in there and I want you to lay at his feet, uncover his feet and just stay there. When he wakes up, he'll let you know what you have to do. Sounds pretty racy. Probably a lot more racy than what I'm telling you right now. But she says, okay, I'll, I'll trust you. I'll do what you tell me to do. And she does that very thing. That night, big party. Boaz has enough to eat and drink. He's satiated. He's feeling good about the harvest, a harvest they hadn't had in years. He goes and lays down and goes to sleep. Ruth sneaks in, lays down at his feet. About midnight, he wakes up. He looks down, and there's this woman lying at his feet. He's startled, and it's dark. He says, woman, who are you? And she says, don't be mad. It's me. It's Ruth, your kinswoman. I would have you take right of her first refusal for me and take me into your house as your own. Now, that sounds kind of weird, right? But you know, Boaz, he's very flattered by this whole deal because he's not exactly a spring chicken, right? And she, he says, you could have had your pick of anybody to be your husband, and yet you have chosen me. May God bless you even more than he already has. Yes, I will do that. But, but you need to know, there's one who's an even closer relative than me who really has right of first refusal for a relationship with you to bring you into his house. So I have to ask him first. So we have to work this out. Now, you leave here right now and don't let anybody see you because if they see you coming out of my joint, they're going to get to talking and then the whole deal is scotched. So you just... Stay undercover, go back to Naomi, and here, I'll give you even more grain to take back to her. And he loads her up with six sacks of grain and, takes, and sends her back to Naomi. She gets back to Naomi, her mother-in-law, and tells her what happened. And she says, oh, don't worry about it. Boaz is going to work things out. You can better believe he didn't go back to sleep right now. He's working on what he needs to do, and he's not going to rest until this deal is sealed. Well, the next day, Boaz sets himself up the city gates, because he's looking for this relative of his who has actually the right of first refusal in this situation. And he sees the guy coming. And he says, hey, friend, come on over here. <whistles> Cousin, come on over. You heard that Naomi's back, right? He says, yeah, I have heard things, uh, you know, about Naomi coming back. Ellie Malik, right? Yeah, 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 our cousin Ellie Malik, yeah. Well, she's got this field that belongs to Ellie Malik, and she wants to sell it now. Um, and I would be interested in buying it if you're not. But since you're the closest relative, you have right of first refusal on that field. So tell me now if you're going to buy it or not. Because if you're not, I'll make the deal. And this guy gets to thinking, like, hmm, that's a pretty good piece of ground. I'm familiar with that field. Butts up right against mine. Yeah, I think I will make a deal on that field. And then uh, Boaz says, well, hang on, though. I, I forgot to mention. Uh, with the field comes a woman named Ruth. It's, uh, you know, Naomi's uh, daughter-in-law. Um, you have to take her with the land, you know, into your house. And he's like, oh, well, that could complicate things at home for me. <laughs> um, I don't think that'd be such a good idea for me. So hard pass, hard pass on that. So Boaz has, is all set. He's ready to make the deal, and he goes back to Ruth, and he lets her know that he will take her into his home. And now Naomi and Ruth have security being brought into Boaz's family. And what you need to know next is that this relationship with Boaz and Ruth, they produce a son whose name is Obed. And when Obed's born, Naomi takes him into her arms as her own. Naomi becomes her grandbaby's nurse. And people are all twittering around town, oh, God has given Naomi a baby. She, they call him Naomi's little boy. But Obed becomes the father of Jesse, who becomes the father of David, Israel's great king. Hmm. By Boaz, Ruth gives birth to Obed. And not only that, but a future is given back to her. And out of Bethlehem, right, out of the house of bread, the promise of a future is born until in that same city, centuries later, 
the many times grandson of Ruth, is born into the world to open up a future for all people through the crazy, wild gift of his own life for people who could never even hope to earn it or deserve it. See, on a day when we remind ourselves of the touchstone of our faith, I can't hardly think of a better story than that of Ruth and Naomi's. By holding on to each other, right, through grief and loss and hopelessness and in hope that God was actually watching over them, history turns and everything changes. Perhaps it could be that way even with us. If only we clung to one another in hope, even through grief and even through loss. Everything changes. Amen. We're going to sing together a hymn. It's hymn number 598. For by grace you have been saved. Pay attention to the words that we sing. I would have you stand as you're able as we sing this one together. For by grace you have been saved. And even faith is not your own. It's the gift of God for you and not the works that you have done. Don't let anybody boast, for this is God's great gift. Amen. So child is my own. When you're weak, then you are strong, for this is God's great gift. Amen. So this weakness with contentment I'll accept now in myself. All my hardships, pains, and griefs that still I deep within myself. When I'm weak, then I am strong, for this is God's great gift. confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Gracious and merciful God, We pray for all who long for a word of truth and for the radical grace that flows from the cross. In the spirit of Ruth, inspire congregations to freely and boldly exhibit your love for all people with persistence and hope. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for your creation, for mountains, rivers, streams, cities, homesteads, and neighborhoods. Write in our hearts a new love and care for creation. Give us the will to curb wasteful habits and to hold accountable those who neglect the vulnerable. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for all who aspire to public office and for all who vote. 
Pour wisdom and understanding upon all who govern so that communities of justice and peace may thrive. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for all who long for healing in mind, body, or spirit, especially today Donna, Peg, Barb, Grayson, Ian, and those we name in our hearts. Strengthen hospitals, clinics, counseling centers, nursing homes, and recovery centers to be holy spaces of renewal that all might live the abundant life you intend. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for all who seek to grow in faith and love of you. Guide teaching and learning and confirmation, small groups, Sunday school, kid zone, youth group, schools, seminaries, and universities. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We give you thanks for all the saints and reformers who have gone before us who dwell in your holy habitation. Give us courage through their example to challenge unjust systems and work toward life-giving reformation. We remember today Shirley Burnett and Danielle Hartman. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. I invite you to be seated even as I commend to you uh, the prospect of sharing Christ's peace with those around you, not only here today after service is done, but out into your week, wherever it takes you, places of work or school in your neighborhoods, be the hands and feet of Christ there. As we get ready to receive the offering this morning, a reminder that all the money is collected in the Love Your Neighbor jar during our offering time and during... Um, uh, communion as you come forward, the Love Your Neighbor jar is right out in front. All that money is going to the Share the Dream project uh, for artisans in Guatemala, and so we uh, invite your generosity that way. We receive the morning offering.
I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing together our offertory song. Let the vineyards be fruitful, Lord, and fill to the brim our cup of blessing. Gather a harvest from the seeds that were sown, that we may be fed with the bread of life. Gather the hopes and dreams of all, unite them with the prayers we God of all creation, all that you have made is good, and your love endures forever. You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us now with these gifts that we might be for the world signs of your gracious presence. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. We invite all who have worshiped with us today, who desire what is offered in this meal, the grace and love and mercy of Jesus in bread and wine to come forward and commune with us today or to come forward for a blessing. We would ask that you pick up a cup from the trays in the center aisle as you come forward, unless you desire grape juice instead of the wine. The grape juice is already poured for you up in front. Just ask the server and that's what you will receive. We also have gluten-free wafers available for those for whom that is a need. Again, ask and you will receive. The table is set. Let's eat and drink and be blessed together.
I invite you to stand as you're able to receive the blessing. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace. Amen. God of abundance with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you've united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Good to have all of you with us uh, on this beautiful October 31st Sunday, Reformation Sunday. I see we got a few people wearing red out there. That's good. A reminder that next Sunday now is All Saints Sunday for us. It's that day we commemorate, remember those who have gone before us in the faith, um, celebrate our connection with them. And part of that is always a slideshow that we run during communion. And Folks submit pictures of those that they are particularly remembering this All Saints Sunday. So you're invited to get those pictures into us ASAP. In fact, I would give you the uh, assignment of going home today, getting on your computer and sending them to us via email tonight sometime so that we, or at the latest tomorrow, so that we have them and we can put those into the slideshow that will then run during communion. So as we commune, we're doing it with all the saints too. So... Put that in your thinking. Today we have an adult ed opportunity on uh, vocation, and um, that's back in the conference room area. And this particular one should be interesting. It's on the vocation of massage therapy. So um, come, and, come and learn how God works through all kinds of different vocations uh, the, today. So what else am I... Kid Zone starts this Wednesday, the first Kid Zone, right? And so uh, you're still welcome to come, even if you haven't signed up yet, but we'd like you to get signed up ASAP. Register online, just go to our website, and you'll find the links, okay? For Kid Zone, it's that after school program on the first Wednesday of the month. So that happens now. Is there anything else that I'm neglecting? I don't think so. Ah, uh, yeah. Set your, let's see, fall back next week, right? Clocks go back an hour, so I'm wondering how many people we'll see at 7.30 in the morning next week. Usually it's not a problem in the fall. It's the spring one that gets us. It's that leaping ahead business. But yeah, set your clocks back this coming week. All right, let's stand up and let's sing ourselves out of worship this morning with our sending song, 729, The Church of Christ in Every Age. We're singing verses 1, 3, and 5.
cease to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Jesus. Thanks a lot.